It is the young who have always fought the old men's wars. They are the cannon fodder, the frontline troops, the GIs and Tommies, Marines and bomber boys. At its best, war is fear cloaked in courage. At its worst, it is the devil's harvest. Across the decades, the sound and fury of Adolf Hitler still haunts. The Third Reich built the most powerful military the world had ever seen and taught mankind a new and terrifying word, Blitzkrieg. September, 1939. War comes to a world that does not want it. The Second World War was the most violent conflict in human history. And many of its bloody battles were fought in the air by men barely out of their teens. Us guys were just happened to be that age. And this is the way it, it was. It happens, it has happened thousands of times. The ones that are of age have to carry it out. We pass them each day without remark. The bomber boys have now grown old, but once they were freedom's sons, snared in an evil and dangerous time. A debt is owed to this last great generation, which can never be repaid, but at least it should not be forgotten. Remembrance Day, 11 a.m., and the skateboard park is full. What year did World War II start? Oh, crap. Uh, oh, oh. I think I missed that class. <laughs> Okay, who did Canada fight in World War II? Come on, you gotta know this. <laughs> the Russians or something like that? Hitler or something like that? <laughs> Do you know uh, much about what Canada did during that period? Uh, we fought. We, um, I think we used some of our vehicles. My great grandfather's in World War II. What, what did he do? I don't know. I don't know. The half remembered grandfathers were the same age as these skater boys when they went to war. I remember the first mission as being just plum plain scared. Bloody hell. We're just going to go through there. It's, it's a goddamn wall of fire. We have lots of flak, lots of searchlights. Weather was bad. It was just not a good trip. Later in this film, seven average young men will set aside their skateboards and pick up a rifle. Sergeant Williams! Get Baker Flight out of those vehicles and lined up over here. Name. Low. John. I don't want your first name, sweetheart. Last name. Low. From around the world, Good. this group of 21st century candidates will come Stop to an there. original Second World War base to undergo military English. training. Follow me. They will experience life as it was 
for Air Force recruits in the early 1940s, the darkest days of the war. One! You'll do better tomorrow. It's been rough. I'm living in hell. And if you can't hold that up, then how are you supposed to fire it? Get it up! <laughs> and these young men will measure themselves against the courage and the character of their grandfathers. Those old men who fought Bigger flight. that most bloody of all wars. Halt! This program will follow the journey of these seven young men. We will also take a second journey with an original group of bomber boys to their base in England, to the graveyards of Belgium, and into the cockpit of the aircraft they knew so well. The Lancaster. Day one in 1942. These seven volunteers are about to do what their granddads once did. Find their courage and train for war. Recruits are called Baker Flight, and although they have little military experience, each one of these young men stands in tall family shadows. Matthew English is the grandson of a Lancaster pilot, Joe English. Chris Gottfried from Olive Branch, Mississippi, is the grandson of Joe's navigator, Harvey Gottfried. Martin Harper of England is the grandson of their flight engineer, Jack Mundy. Daniel Crow is from Australia. His granddad was a navigator on a Halifax. Robin Hillman descends from pilot William Campbell, who was killed just days before the end of the war. Yes, that's Sid Stevenson's granddad flew 55 operations and was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. And John Lowe is the grandson of a war hero, John Fraser, who flew with the famed 617 Squadron, the Dam Busters. There, now you're starting to look more like an airman. Instead of some shaggy highland sheep. All of these young men grew up listening to war stories and wondering, could they do the same? You know, you sort of sit back and think, you know, bloody hell, they were hard times and they had no option but to do it, you know, and, and they'd done it. And it's, I'm dead proud, dead proud. Can't imagine, like, especially me, I look really young for my age and I, I couldn't, like, like if there's people looking as young as me going to war, just like, if I was looking the enemy in the face, I just, it's shocking, it's really shocking. Just, it's, we're, we're kids basically going off to serve for our country. Joe English is Matthew's grandfather. Joe was 19, the same age as Matthew is now, when he went to war. Joe learned to fly a Lancaster before he could drive a car. Joe has brought Matthew to this reunion of bomber boys to meet old friends, tell new stories, and celebrate his incredible luck in having grown old. Joe was the skipper of Lancaster H for Howe, the lucky H in 625 Squadron, one group. Six members of Joe's crew of seven are still alive, which is rare, as there are only a handful of surviving Lancaster crews anywhere.
Berlin, Nuremberg, Munich, Joe and his crew flew a complete tour of 30 combat operations against a formidable enemy. Early in the war, Allied bombers were no match for Luftwaffe fighters. For each 100 air crew in bomber command, only 24 survived their tour. We had a few bad trips, you know, and, uh, scary trips. A lot of night fighters were around. We knew they were because they were knocking people down here and there and above us. And we had to be very careful about not getting a plane right up above us, so they'd drop bombs through our wings and that sort of thing. But uh, it just went on like that, on and on. Harvey Gottfried was Joe's navigator. At 26, he was the old man of the crew. Well, I tried hard. I tried hard, you bet. I tell you what, I knew that if anything happened, it's not going to be my fault. I'm going to do my job. I'm going to do my job. And it's not going to be my fault if something happens. Ernie Curteau was their bomb aimer, a tough kid from an orphanage. Ernie was determined to fly. They said, you're qualified, except we can't accept you. I said, why not? He said, you only weigh 117 pounds. And he said, you really want to get in the Air Force? And I said, well, I got to get in the Air Force. And he said, well, he said, go on down the street there and uh, go on into the restaurant and get a sandwich and drink about five or six glasses of water and come back and we'll see if we can weigh you. I, only, I come back and I had gained a pound. Burke Thomas, who grew up on a tumbleweed ranch, covered their backs from the mid-upper gun turret. Our gunnery leader used to tell us frequently to never, never talk over a close call. Forget it, because there's going to be another one the next night. <laughs> so just if you have a close call, don't hash it over and so on. And we didn't. Sixty years after surviving the war together, this remarkable group of men has also grown old together. But sadly, in the course of making this documentary, one member of the crew will pass away. Okay, well, you're gonna need it. In the mirror of time, life in those days seems innocent, but ahead lay unimaginable horrors, which would test even the strongest of those who fought, who fought in order that we could live our lives. But could we live theirs? Matthew and the 21st century recruits are about to find out. Standard Ace One! Three years ago in Ottawa, Canada, these men brought forth a plan that was to prove a decisive factor in winning the war. The idea, send young men from all parts of the empire to Canada for Air Force training. And from Britain, from New Zealand, from Australia, from the plains and farms and cities of Canada, young men flocked to join the RCAF. Canada became the empire's reservoir for trained airmen. Aircrew training was designed to create teams, not heroes. Most recruits dreamed of becoming pilots, but only about one in three achieved their goal. The rest went into other combat roles in the Air Force, or became ground crew. But no matter where he ended up, every recruit began at the same place, beneath the merciless gaze of the drill sergeant. Simple directions, people. These are very, very simple directions. Remember what I said. This is day one. First impressions are made on this day. Make a good one. Move! And this one uh, <clears throat> corporal, he really rimmed us out. And he says, where do you think you are, home or some other dirty old rotten hole? <laughs> and that became a saying around our outfit, where do you think you are? <laughs> and, uh, and this is the way it was for all during basic training. It was like that, but you get so, it doesn't bother you. Yep, two minutes from the time that I leave the room. When I come back in, you'll be standing in those shorts. Your jeans and your socks will be on the shelf behind you. You'll be in nothing but what you're wearing now. The boxer shorts, bare feet. 
Understood. Yes, Sergeant yeah. Williams. Martin Harper plays keyboard in a rock band. He doesn't know what it'll do for the rest of his life. But one thing's for sure, he'd rather be anywhere but here. I totally didn't expect it to be like it is. I kind of expected it to be, I don't know, a, a lot easier, a lot, a lot less like 1942. Because it's for 1942 here and, ah. Oh. They arrived by the tens of thousands. Young men came to Canada from around the world to the camps of the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, the BCATP. Owen Favell was a flight instructor at one of these camps in 1944. He shot this rare film, which has never before been broadcast. Every day was a new adventure. It was a new accomplishment. Everything you did was something either you hadn't been done, done before or you'd only just been shown. It was upbeat. And um, I, I suppose most of us were doing what we really wanted to do. Early in the war, the Allies needed air crew and needed them fast. Every recruit got a chance to fly, sometimes with tragic results. Almost a thousand recruits, mostly teenage boys from a dozen countries, were killed in training. They were boys like Chris Gottfried. Pull him up more. Pull the pants more. I didn't know anything, and nobody else knew anything. We were all just running around, and we kept getting yelled at right in our face. It was just constant yelling right in our face. It was hell. Drive your body. Get this thing sorted out right now. The reason why... 60 years ago, Chris's granddad, Harvey, also struggled with his uniform. <laughs> and I got that uniform on, and I was real concerned about the fit and so on, such like... Uh, the, uh, my shoes, uh, I had a pair of shoes that were, uh, I think, a size or so too big, and I had to wait a couple of days before they could get me a pair of shoes that really fit and such. But uh, that all worked out real well, and I, I felt pretty good about wearing the uniform. When I direct an individual to do something, they do it immediately, as a group. As a group, you wait for the executionary term, move. Boots on, move. Matthew oh, English right. has spent his first morning missing his hair. I don't know if you'll be able to see uneven haircut. We got some long ass strands in here. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, Barbara. <laughs> That was the quickest haircut I ever had in my entire life. But uh, yeah, the haircut was uh, not the best. Uh, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, I miss having a bit of length in the hair. I was planning on growing my hair on the end. The bed has a racing stripe on it. That stripe has to be directly down the center of the bed. Few of these boys have ever been shown how to properly make a bed. And hospital corners, a complete mystery. Like many things from their 21st century lives, this will soon change. Oh, yeah. so, so like you lay it completely on it and then you put it this sheet down first. That desk over here is going to be a sample and you're gonna lay it out exactly how that is. Why in the world are you staring at me? Why are you looking at the floor? Sorry, Sergeant. Don't apologize. Just don't do it again. All right, you have your models, you have your kit. You know what you gotta do? Move! I'm just trying to get everything to fly and um, just answer things correctly. I'm failing at the moment, I think, but um, there's room for improvement, definitely. Yeah. I'm trying to get used to it. I don't see how my grandfather did this, because I think it's pretty crazy. I really do. The human person adapts quickly, I found. And we did. We adapted to it. And, and what they called us and what they did, it didn't bother us. There's no lingering 
animosity whatsoever. You, make sure you bring all those instruments that I told you to bring with you to your next class. Do not bow your head. Over the area, move. Some things in the military never change. The food is bad, the pay worse, and the drill square worst of all. Drill was came very easy for me, but some of the some of them had a real hard time. In fact, one poor guy, I feel sorry for him yet. He just couldn't march. He didn't know his left foot from his right foot, and and uh, <laughs> I think it bothered all of us. <laughs> But uh, he passed. Daniel Crow is from Australia. At 26, he's the oldest member of Baker Flight. Well, we know that after three and a half weeks or so, we're going to see our wives and girlfriends and family again. And we're not going to die by being shot down in a Lancaster. We're going to fly back on a 747 or whatever and be welcomed home with open arms you know, with people who look exactly the same and have you know, only had three weeks of their lives without us. At 17, Sid Stevenson is the youngest recruit. He's a prairie farm boy who sings in the village choir. I miss home and plus I'm Missing the harvest at my place right now. So, being here, that is. So that's too bad. Um, yeah, I miss my family. Yeah. Better get to bed. Attention! One! Standard age! One! Bring your leg up. Bring your leg up. Everybody, left leg up. Now. Up. Up. There was always someone that was out of step or uh, uh, out of sorts or out of line or some such thing, you know, and uh, there was a lot of hollering going on. And, uh, but uh, as long as they weren't hollering at me, I felt pretty good. <laughs> you might think of this as drill and something you just got to get over, but no, this is a step of calibration. If you can't pass this part, you may as well just leave. This is an instrument that we need to operate equipment that kill people. For the bomber boys of Baker Flight, this is their first day on the drill square. During their granddad's war, recruits practiced for months, and it was time well spent. Drilling builds teamwork. It also teaches recruits to react without thinking. And in war, quick reactions save lives. And he said, OK, right turn, in line, quick march. And he started, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. Left, right, left, right, left, right, left, left. We were a good, very good crew, and we were a very coordinated group, about 25, 30 guys, I forget how many, in rows of three, you know, we'd be doing some pretty fancy marching. Uh, slant marching, going this way and straightening out and all that. Air crew training lasted about two years. When it was over, most recruits were posted to Europe. Harry Schmuck was 19 when he said goodbye to his family and left for war. Guess what, Mom? I'm going to be an air gunner. She said, what's that? And I said, it's a great job. You just sit in the plane, and the pilot flies you all over. You don't have to walk anywhere. You know? <laughs> I didn't tell her that in 1943, the life expectancy of an air gunner was three minutes in combat. And Lancaster pilot Reg Patterson had just turned 20 when he was sent overseas. You never thought you were going to die. No one ever did. I don't think, anyway. Most of the guys figured they were immune to that sort of thing. 
but uh, you knew better, Chris, later, later on, when the guy in the next bed wasn't there the next morning. And now our turn is coming. If we don't let down, we have stood up to the enemy. We can strike back harder, longer. Now it's our turn to choose when and where we strike. And when we do, watch out. Wartime England was an exciting place for air crew like Joe English. And it wasn't long before he met Harvey, a hotshot navigator who had a motorcycle. And best of all, Harvey knew where the pubs were. To get to know each other, we would go up to these little pubs out of the station at evenings, put a big uh, crock of beer in the middle of the table and um, have a ball. He seemed like a real regular guy, a regular guy, you know. Uh, he was no smart aleck, uh, no nothing, and uh, he looked to me like a gung-ho pilot. Women love men in uniforms, or so they say, with wings on their chests and pounds in their pockets. The two young bomber boys were ready for action. Personal hygiene. There's a couple of reasons why it's important. It's important to you and your ability to function because if you let it slip, it has repercussions, i.e. Old soldiers say out, almost as many men have been injured in the bedroom the as on the battlefield. And the safe sex campaign 1940 style had just one message. Don't. The title of the film is very dangerous. It can be also termed VD or venereal disease, and it could be debilitating to you. So my advice is keep it in your pants. <laughs> we doctors know that everyone should be very well informed regarding venereal disease. They are both usually acquired by sexual intercourse with an infected person. To the lining of the tubes into the deeper ditches. Inflammation starts, pus forms, runs down and appears to the end of the penis. During this stage, the man notices such mild symptoms as irritation, a burning sensation when he passes water. These women are always infected. There is no such thing as a safe prostate. Remember then, beware of pickup. Beware of prostitutes. So there you have it, gentlemen. Beware of pickups. Beware of prostitutes. All right, keep it in your pants or take care of business yourselves. We got two dollars a day flying pay alone. Well, that's a lot of money, you know. In 1943-44, I had more money than I knew what to do with, you know. So, when you have lots of money, uh, <clears throat> you draw a lot of uh, chicks, as they say. <laughs> right, up, right. BCATP recruits were told they were the best and the brightest. In their blue uniforms and stylish wedge caps, they symbolized a new type of soldier, the air warrior. Every candidate dreamed of wearing the coveted wings, but to earn them took hard work and ability. Right, sit down. My name. Ward Officer One, no. Remove your headdress. History and law, You're ranks and responsibilities. Recruits averaged 45 hours of classes a week. If you're not prepared for this challenge, gentlemen, the course is young. You don't want to learn? There's the door. Don't waste our time and don't waste your time. Is that clear? Yes, sir. I can't hear you. Yes, sir. I worried a little bit about uh, uh, having the passing grades. 
in order to uh, get through this uh, the schooling that they're giving me. Uh, I really have to work hard at my studies because I had been so far behind. Yeah. I didn't have the algebra or the trig and so on. So I'll put three slash four engines. An essential class was aircraft recognition. Knowing friend from foe often meant the difference between life and death. The Lancaster may also be confused with other four-engine bombers. These seven represent the most prominent types in the world. Let's whip them around to see if you can pick the Lancaster. Come on, make up your mind. It's in the middle. When you see a Lancaster on the wing, it's a friend. So praise the Lord and save your ammunition. Uh, Air crew recruits were taught three basic rules for staying alive. Work as a team, know your enemy, and expect the unexpected. Stand up! Sit down! Bomber command flew mostly at night in streams of hundreds of aircraft, and concentration was crucial. Searchlights were bad, flak worse, but everyone feared the German night fighters as they stalked the bomber crews without mercy. They wanted to get underneath us because they were mounted a whole bunch of 20 millimeter cannons that were firing straight up out of the plane, not ahead of the plane, but they would try to go underneath you and they would give you a burst, 20 or 50 rounds of ammunition, trying to come up to go through your plane to hit any of the bombs that were on you. One oh nines and eighty eights, FWs and one tens. The calculus of the air war had its own terrible logic. Operational losses were anticipated at four percent, acceptable at five. But on many nights, especially early in the war, as many as ten percent of crews were lost. The Army really didn't get into the fight until 43. It's the Air Force that's kind of bearing the brunt of casualties. But I suspected at the time this was seen as, and this is a horrible phrase, but the cost of doing business. Um, that's the cost of fighting a war. Despite the losses, Bomber Command ordered attacks deep into occupied Europe. The German defenses were strong, and flak batteries ringed most targets. But a new aircraft was coming off the assembly line, one that would change the course of the war, the Lancaster. And as the dawn broke over the roofs of the plant, we took our big plane out of her hangar slowly onto the gray concrete runway. Remember, this was to be our last contact with her. To us, she was a living thing. The propaganda machine called it the shining sword of victory. Those who flew one called the Lancaster their best hope for staying alive. Well, it was a beautiful aircraft to fly. It flew, it responded quickly, it took a lot of punishment, and it carried an enormous amount of bombs. I think it even, you see, an air normal load is about 14,000 uh, pounds worth of bombs, and uh, you need about three B-17s flying fortresses to carry what one Lancaster could carry. And of course, it could carry up to 22,000 pounds. I think it even surprised the, even the, the uh, designer. You never worried about the Lancaster letting you down. No, you couldn't talk about enemy action because you didn't know what was going to happen to you. But the machine itself would never let you down. I think everybody flying on ops had occasions when the plane did things that you never were supposed to do with an airplane. But I can remember one night I got coned uh, over the target, and the only way you can get out of a cone, because they're going to shoot up the cone at you, is to change your altitude fast. So I just rolled over on her back and took her through. And down she went, and uh, the old airspeed indicator was nudging up around 400 miles an hour, which was far too fast for the sign. In fact, over the airspeed indicator said, do not dive this aircraft over 360 miles an hour. But she pulled out, no sweat. And I had the boys check it when they got home, and they couldn't find a rivet even popped anywhere, you know. I got along great with the, the good old Lancaster. You know, Halifax was very nice. The Lancaster was just a little better uh, to me. Uh, it, it seemed a little 
especially once you got it up in the air, it was a more maneuverable. When Joe was finally posted to a combat squadron, they were flying legs. He was now surrounded by veteran pilots, proud of carrying the fight to the enemy. Their motto, we avenge. Two years after finishing high school, Joe English had reached the tip of the spear. Bomber Command had an unusual way of selecting flight crews. In the American Air Force, you were assigned to a crew. But here, you, you, uh, you did it sort of on a voluntary basis. They put us in a great big room. I think it was a hangar. And all of these guys would just wander around. And uh, the pilot would be saying, I'm looking for a navigator, you know. I'm looking for a wireless operator. I'm looking for a bomb aimer, you know. And then all of a sudden, he says, I'm looking for some gunners. And you would wander around, and the ne next thing you know, everybody was crewed up. Harry Schmuck was a 19-year-old mid-upper gunner on a Halifax who became a priest after the war. He flew 28 combat missions with the same crew. There was something behind this. We never said anything about it, but we knew that once we got to the squadron, we're gonna live together, or we're gonna die together, or we're gonna end up in a POW camp. And that was what behind some of this bonding, you know. The Lucky H crew met while Joe and Harvey Gottfried were waiting for tea at the mobile canteen called the Naffy Wagon. George Stoll and I was in the lineup for the Naffy Wagon, and just in front of us was two Canadians. I found these two tall air gunners standing by themselves and looking kind of uh, lonely and way at the back, not knowing what to do. And I, I didn't really know much, but we had to approach somebody. And I told this Joe, I says, well, I'm from Alberta. And he says, well, that's good or something like that. And before we left the Naffy wagon, the four of us was crewed up together. George Stowe, who the crew nicknamed Boris, was the rear gunner. George passed away a few years ago. Ernie Croteau was the next to join. A veteran bomb aimer, Ernie had seen a lot of combat and already knew what they were in for. I've got memories and whatnot, and there's some good, there's some laughable, and there's some that are really, really, you don't like to keep thinking about them. With Ernie on board, there were still two empty seats on Joe's Lank. These were filled by a couple of Englishmen, Jack Monday and Mike Chalk. The average Englishman is a fairly dignified fellow, and especially Mike. Mike was very concerned about going with a Canadian crew. He used to call us colonials anyway, just, just for fun, just to make us mad, you know. All these guys, I mean, they were the greatest guys I could have met. The greatest guys I could have met, yeah. The year was 1944, and the Lucky H had its crew. Yeah, we were a crew, it was great. Yeah, it, was, it was sort of real nice to know that you belonged. What is that? Uh, Meatball. The bomber boys of Baker Flight are also becoming a crew. No longer strangers, they found something in common. <laughs> Girls. I'm just gonna go visit my girlfriend during lunch at school. Just hang out with her for lunch. Check around the back of the uh, sports shed. <laughs> sports shed. I'm sure you know, absence will make your love grow stronger. I, I'm sure. I think I'll um, take it on a bit better. Not get into as many, not get into as many fights mm -hmm. or arguments with her. Just because, like, I know that if I'm gone this long, could you imagine if, like. I went away and died. Yeah. I, like if I felt and no matter what uh, conversation would start, it would always end up about girls, as a rule, when you're 18 years old. Mm -hmm. And all of them, well, a lot of them had a girlfriend at home, and I think most of them all got a Dear John eventually. They're probably better off for it. <laughs> so 
to watch out for them prostitutes, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And tramps. And pickups. Yeah, pickups. What I want you to do now is relax. I want you to get out your brass polishing plate. That's a thing I showed you earlier. It has been a long day, which is not over yet. The discipline is quite hard to get used to. I mean, I've never entered any sort of military service in my life. I mean, it's, it's not really a common thing in England. It's like, um, I don't know, it's, uh, it's just a bit of a shock to the system, to be honest with you. Your buttons, which must be polished tonight, a very light coat, make them shiny. Aircrew training was not intended to break the spirit of recruits, just stretch it. Polishing boots and shining brass instilled discipline, and discipline saved lives. Tonight, you're going to have these things polished. By tomorrow morning, they're going to look nice and shiny for inspection. They're making us do these things like shine our boots, and they're making us put creases in our beds. And I think mentally it just gets you in a state of mind that Every minute detail is important. Good? How about you? Not too bad, sir. Not too bad? It's the aggression. Physically, I'm, I'm fit for it, I believe, but it's just the aggression. Just having to put it, it's mental. For me, it's real mental. And then, you know, you think about home, and you want to go home, and then, but then you have to think about this. You're constantly thinking about this, because that's, you've got commands being put into your mind, and you just have to do that, and you can't really think about anything else. So, it's strenuous. <laughs> okay, guys, um, what, what are three chevrons? John Lowe wants to do well here. Not everyone knows it. His grandfather was a dam buster, and John was raised on tales of wartime adventure. Down it, and it should just twist a little bit, and then it'll stick. It's kind of being almost like going to, I mean, maybe a new culture, a new country, I mean, Everything's different, nothing is the same. You don't know what the expectations of the people are. You don't understand the language, kind of like we don't understand the military language that well. Um, clothing's different, food's different, and people get mad at you for the simplest of things that you, at home you would have not even thought about doing. I honestly can't even imagine just like going away for years. Like I'm worried about like not even 30 days. It's it's it boggles my mind just how how mentally they could just put this all together and do this for their country. 60 years ago, another generation of young men sat on their beds and jumped when the sergeant barked. They were told the future of Western civilization rested on their young shoulders, as they, and they alone, were to carry the fight to the very heart of the enemy. January 2nd, 1945. Joe English and the crew learn they are on the battle orders for that night. It will be their first combat operation. The Lucky H is filled with 1,700 gallons of petrol and five tons of bombs. It will join 521 other aircraft on a flight the crew will never forget. Their target, Nuremberg. I remember thinking to myself, boy, I'll never live through 29 more of these. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> We come far closer to being defeated than what we think. Next time on Bomber Boys, the shooting war begins. This guy's trying to come around behind you, but he's got to get his guns in front of you, not behind you. And then you'd go this way, and he'd be up here, you see. You are a feather plucked from the wings of the angel of death, Gottfried. Right, Baker left, Flight gets right, a taste left. of old time discipline. Left, right, left, right, left. Left, right, left, right, left, right, left. And the strain of military life begins to take its toll. Just, it's the combination of wearing this uniform and this heat is just too much. 
That's next time on Bomber Boys. Mpongo! Mpongo! Mpongo!